This program is made possible by the partners and friends of Bob Yandian Ministries. Coming up on this episode of Student of the Word. It hasn't changed at all. What God is looking for is faithfulness. And Proverbs tells us it's difficult to find a faithful man. It says qualified people are everywhere. A man that can brag on himself, you can find him everywhere. But a faithful man who can find. Faithfulness is the key to the point of separation. So if you've got a call on your life, stick with it. Take any door that opens up. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And then one day that door is going to open wide open and God's going to say, now I can trust you. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and something to take notes with and study the Word of God with Pastor Bob Yandian. Hello and welcome again to Student of the Word. So glad to have you with us. I want to say very quickly to those that are watching the program, I know many of you are called into the ministry and this particular lesson is for you. And I'm speaking to those who know that you definitely have a call to the ministry, but you wonder why it's not turning up. And uh, I want you to come because we're going to talk about something so simple today that often we overlook it. And we think that somehow God's going to call us in the ministry because of our diplomas and all that. For all of you graduates of Rama for CBC or whatever college you came out of, university or Bible training center, that's important. But we're going to talk about something that's so key and so important today. And I also want to mention to my faithful supporters, those of you who for years have been following me in the ministry and have been giving into the ministry, those of you who just love the, the teaching of the Word of God and, and value this ministry, and not just because of me, but because the calling that's on my life and the gifting that's there and the revelation of the Word that you've had through the years, it brings stability into your life. And I just want you to know part of that stability is the fact that you turn around and you become a blessing back to the ones who blessed you. And it says in Galatians that we are to give to those that constantly give into our life. And uh, so you're doing that. And I want to thank you for it, for your prayers and for your financial support. And for those of you that aren't doing that, please join with this other group that's doing it. Join with the fact that even if nobody was in a group, you would still do it because you love the ministry of the Word of God and it's changed your life. There is no amount of money you can put on one revelation that comes from God. One revelation so exceeds the farthest of what you could give because it's eternal. The money you're giving is temporary, but the results are eternal. So thank you again for your giving into this ministry. I appreciate you so much. Well, back to what we're teaching on today, and that is we're going to get into this thing that I think is so important in the ministry, and that is what if you have a call on your life? And I believe every person has a call in their life, but what is it that brings that to full fruition? Now, some of you might know in, in your heart that you just kind of, you know, you love teaching. People often ask me, how do you know what the will of God is? First of all, find out what you'd like to do. If you had a choice in the church of looking at all the different ministries in there, which one would you like to do the most? Would you rather usher, or would you rather teach a class, or would you rather greet at the front door, or take care of children, or take your, that begins right there with a seed that's in you. God will give to you the desires of your heart, meaning this, not just because it's there, God will give you that uh, result of that desire. No, he actually places the desire there. So start out with this. If you had a choice, what would you like to do? You know, I've often seen kids in high school, they'll have a, you know, a, a day dedicated to occupation, occupation day, and they'll bring in all these different tables and set them around the auditorium. And when the students get in there, they're just said, go find the one, you know, and all of a sudden the children don't all run over. The young people don't all run over to one table, you know, to, to be a musician or run over to one table to be an actor or run, you know, we often think that's what all the kids want. You turn them loose and those kids will separate and go around the room and you'll find some sitting over here in a blue collar job, one over here in manufacturing, one over here in, in, you know, working with a computer behind a desk, accounting, all the different things because why? They're just running toward the thing they like the most. That is part of what makes a success in life. And I think it's wrong for parents to push, push, push their children in education to go for the ones that are paying the most money. Listen, you find the place that you love. And if you love what you're doing, you'll never work a day in your life. On top of that, you'll be rewarded for it because the harder you work at it and the better you become, you'll become isolated from the rest of the population and people will flock to your door, beat a path to your door because you are the best at what you do. So again, I come back to it. The same is true in the ministry. If if you take the children, the young people, and ask them what they would like to do for God, some will tell you they'd like to work with young people. Some will tell you they'd like to work with children. Some may say, I want to be an evangelist and win souls. Others may say, I want to be a missionary. Don't put that down and say, well, that's just you. No, it's probably God's desire in there that will one day manifest itself. I found this out in my own life. 
That was when the call of God finally came to me. It's like at the moment, it's like, oh, that's a surprise. But really, it wasn't a surprise. It's like I've always known it. It's just I was surprised at the moment when it came, how clear it was. And to realize all this time, my little, my desire in me that I just love to do was really God's call on my life. So the point of it is we come back to it. We're going to find out though, once you get that call, how do you come to the point where the door finally opens for you? Because I had lots of young people in my church that graduated from Rhema and ORU when I was pastoring in Tulsa. And, uh, you know, or I'd go to other churches and minister there. And the same thing would happen. There'd be young people there that, you know, they might have come up through the church. They might have taken some classes. They might have gone to a, a ministry preparation school or whatever, but they're just sitting there waiting on something to happen and nothing happens. And they'll be sitting there for 10 years going, well, the, the door hadn't opened yet. And uh, we'll get into it today because there's two points to the ministry it's called calling and separation. And I have a book on it right here that really, honestly, is one of my best selling books because it's so simple to describe how that if you have a call, how do you finally reach that point of separation where God pulls you away from the rest of the pack and puts you into the ministry? Because until that time, you're just sitting in the congregation, you're working around the church, you're part of the pack that's there, but God pulls you out and it's happened throughout the word of God. Look with me at Romans chapter one and verse one. Romans 1.1, 1, 1. this is Paul addressing the Roman congregation. He goes back on his own personal call and talks about it here. In Romans 1.1, 1, 1, it says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and separated into the gospel of God. I want you to notice two words there, called and separated. These are the two parts that Paul is reflecting back on in his life. He was called to be an apostle, but then one day he was separate under the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul began this book on Romans with the twofold aspect of the ministry, calling and separation. Things have not changed at all today. They are still the same. Paul's ministry began supernaturally. He was on the road to Damascus going to kill Christians and a zealot for the Jewish religion and just, you know, far above anybody else in the Jewish religion as far as a zeal for the law and a zeal to kill Christians and anyone that stood in the way. And so Paul was on his way there. And of course, what happened was a blinding light fell on him. He fell off onto the ground off of his horse or whatever he was riding. And uh, when he was there, the Lord spoke to him. And that blinding light was so bad that when he got up, he couldn't see. And he managed to get to the town. And there he met a, a man named Ananias. And Ananias was called by God to be there. And Ananias took care of him laid his hands on his eyes and Paul could see right after that. And so Ananias was just a general guy. I mean, he was not like called, he's not an apostle, he's not a prophet. He's not a, a big minister of the word of God. He was just one of those lay people in the church working, but God used him at this time. And as he laid hands on and Saul and Saul could now see what happened was he said, here's what's going to happen in your life. He said, you're going to be called to the Gentiles. And you're going to be standing before kings and all this. He began to prophesy to him what was going to happen. But even at that point, even though at that point, Paul realized he had a call of God, it didn't come to pass. He even mentions in the book of Galatians, it was some 14 years he was in preparation for ministry before he ever came to the Jerusalem church, before he ever came to the churches of Judea and got to minister there. So well, that was on the road to Damascus where Jesus appeared to him. And then the Lord also told Ananias, and that was what he was to do, of get all the things he was to do. So Paul was a chosen vessel born to bear witness by God to the name of Jesus, to the Gentiles. And God had known it long before it was revealed to Saul and long before it was revealed to Ananias. And so the Lord knew it all the time. And so now Saul begins to understand that. Of course, later on, his name was named to Paul. So Again, Saul or Paul learned of the what God had for him and the Lord knew it before the foundation of the world. So later he was separated under the gospel. And the word called is the word call out. Oh, it means to summon or to call out loud. And what the Lord was simply saying to, I've called you out and I've called you out loud and I've spoken this over you. So there comes a calling on your life. And of course, it's the same word found throughout the word of God for calling. When a person would call out to another, something like that. And we're even called into the gospel, called into the ministry. And uh, uh, again, it's used through the word of God for us. But here it's used in this passage of scripture for really literally just telling Paul what his calling would be. He's not in it yet. The Lord is just announcing this is what's going to happen. And then later he was separated under the gospel. The word separate is his amphoreo, and the word means to uh, be set apart by boundaries. The Lord simply says you're without boundaries when you first begin. The more you begin and get to that point of separation, it finally comes a point of separation when I pull you out and you become basically an entity to yourself. And I want to take that when that happened. When did the point of separation occur? Look with me at Acts chapter 13. 
Acts chapter 13, and this is the time. Now, Paul, until this time, he still isn't known as Paul. He's still called Saul. And, uh, but at this time, uh, he was going to be called out by God. And after this, he'll be known as Paul. When he becomes, take, fully steps into that ministry of the apostle and fully steps into that ministry of spreading the gospel to the Gentiles, his name is changed to Paul from Saul. In the Old Testament, Saul was an evil, wicked king. And so this is basically what uh, Saul of Tarsus has been, is evil and wicked, a zealot for God, like I said, a zealot for the law and filled with enthusiasm. And Key said he killed more than anybody else as far as Christians was concerned. He was a hero among the Jews until God got hold of him. That's why it was difficult in his own ministry too, that so many people had seen him the other way that for 14 years, he said, I was unknown by face. This is in the book of Galatians chapter two. And he said, I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea. And then after 14 years, he went back to the church in Jerusalem, met with Peter and the leaders of the church that were there, including uh, uh, Peter and John and James. And so by meeting with them behind the scenes, they became convinced and slowly it began to spread to where others began to trust them also because they said, how can we trust him? This is the guy that killed so many of us. But again, they saw the change that had come in his life and really comes back to the fact that God can save anyone, will save anyone if their heart is open to him. In Acts chapter 13, it's at the tail end of a time when Paul has been in chapter 9. That's where he got his call on the road to Damascus. In chapter 11 and in chapter 12, he has met with Barnabas. They've started the church at Antioch. And all this time in those chapters, not much is said about Saul because he's been some 14 years away. And, the, you know, uh, history tells us also, it's told in some parts of the word of God, he was in Arabia. And so we don't know what he was doing in Arabia, know where he stayed in Arabia, but this is where he received his revelation of the New Testament that we have today, the revelation of the church age we live in now, the dispensation of grace. So Paul probably is the greatest of the preachers and teachers of the New Testament epistles on the subject of grace, the greatest depth, and yet probably one of the most, again, the most enlightening and balanced in his ministry on the word of God and the grace of God. By the time we come now to chapter 13, he is in a church he helped establish. He and Barnabas established the church. It was a church built upon grace, a church that was so built upon grace, the church of Jerusalem, which was getting bound up in more legalism, going back under the law, trying to mix grace of the New Testament with law of the Old Testament, which the book of Hebrews tells us, the book of Romans tells us, the book of, of uh of James tells us, and also uh, the book of Galatians tells us, you cannot mix the two. The two put together do not, they're water and oil. You can stir it up, but it always separates back. Again, the two do not mix. And Paul has so been under grace and so has uh, the church at Antioch and so has Barnabas. And this church is wonderful. And they're raising up new ministers to go out and preach to the Gentiles. There's apostles and, and, there's, uh, and at the church there is teachers and prophets and others at the church. And one day they're having a, a prayer meeting and the Lord speaks out during the prayer meeting and calls out Barnabas and calls out Saul and begins to tell them that the time has come for them to step into the ministry. This is during a prayer meeting. This is the time of separation. Again, in your ministry, there's a call and there's a time of separation. When we come back from the break, we're not going to get into this verse of scripture. We're going to get into the scriptures that tell us about what to do. What is it that takes that calling on your life and finally brings you to the point of separation where now the door opens up. It's either an evangelistic ministry or some organization opens up. You get hired there and you come in to work for them. And you're now going into the ministry that God's called for you. A church opens up or whatever it may be. Right after the break, when we get back, we'll talk about that. I'll see you in just a moment. Have you ever wondered why some Christians who are obviously called and anointed by God never seem to move into the realm of success? We watch and wonder as they struggle, knocking on doors that never open, while others have opportunities knocking at their door. Why are so many called, but so few chosen? God has a ministry for everyone, and He rewards those who are faithful to His call. Learn the keys to finding and walking in God's purpose for your life with Bob Yandian's book, Calling and Separation. The Calling and Separation book is available for $10 plus shipping and handling. To order your copy, visit bobyandian.com and click on TV offers or call 918-250-2207. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit our website at bobyandian.com and click on Partnership or call us 
at 918-250-2207. All right, welcome back again. We are in Acts chapter 13. I want you to go there with me. We're going to take a look at verses 1 and 2, and this is the beginning of Paul's ministry of separation. This is where he begins with uh, Barnabas, the first missionary journey, because God has a call in his life to go to the nations. And this is where it happens. In Acts chapter 13, verses one and two, it says this, now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, such as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. In this verse of scripture, we have something that's so important, and that is what brings us to that point of separation. For years, Paul has had a calling on his life. For 14 years, he was unknown, separated in Arabia, receiving revelation from God. No one knew he was there, just he and God. And then finally, God released him to come to the churches of Jerusalem or Judea. And he did and met with the leadership of the church, not with the church in general. He didn't present himself to the body. He didn't come and override their authority. He came and spoke to them first. And then slowly he began to be known. And it was known that later after that, he who had persecuted the church was now a servant of God. And this became known. So he started ministering in different areas and stuff, still being, uh, still only having a call on his life, but never the separation coming. There was a preparation time. What brings you from your calling to your separation is preparation. And Paul was, or Saul was preparing himself and preparing himself. And we'll come back to a key word here in just a little bit and talk about it. But at this point right here, this is what happened. And while Saul now is in this prayer meeting and he's been so faithful, he's been teaching wherever he could find an open door. He's helped uh, Barnabas establish this church. Just, just small doors have opened up for him and he's always walked through and taken them. And he's finally reached this point. Let me tell you what that key word is that brings you from the point of calling to separation. It's faithfulness. Just be faithful to what whatever your hand can find to do, do it. It's not just your church attendance. Now see, that's where you start learning the word of God. It's where you start putting the word into application in your daily life. It's when the pastor says, we need somebody to take care of the children. You go, I will. And the pastor says, we need somebody to, I, should, well, I will. We need somebody to teach a class. I will. I mean, that's what, what happened. My wife and I, when our church first began, I wasn't in the ministry. I was at a secular job, but I so wanted to teach. I knew I had a call to teach in my life, but there was no separation. Nobody knew I existed. I actually would go home and put sermons together and no place to preach them. So I would come to church, but pretty soon, you know, I was just, I helped run the audio system. I did recordings and I pulled, uh, our church was portable at the time. We met in different buildings. And so I brought in the PA system and uh, all this was just what I wanted to do. And I mean, no matter what they asked me, I just do it. Cause you know what? I love the church. I just love the people of God. I love the ministry. And I didn't have one particularly except for just these small things around the church, but I was faithful at it. If you prove yourself in the small things, he'll give you great things. And if you don't prove yourself in that which is another man's ministry, how will you have that which is your own? So I, again, I didn't, wasn't even on staff at the church. I was just a volunteer. Whatever I could find to do, I did. I taught an evening class after a while because they saw I could teach. So I started teaching this evening class. And I just loved the class and started just pouring my heart into it. And I started with around 13 people, ended up with 250 people in that class. It just kept growing. But you know what? Through the years I have watched as I pastored a church, many graduates of Bible schools, again, Rama Bible Training Center in Tulsa, ORU, and then other ones where people came from other areas and they came to the city of Tulsa. But the point of it was they just sat in church after graduation and they just waited for some kind of bombshell to fall on them. They just waited on a supernatural light to come from heaven. And the point of it was they wouldn't get involved. And uh, one story is there was a young man in our church that was a Rama graduate and he was a wonderful guy. God, the guy was just incredible. I love the, OR, the ORU students, but man, my real heart went out to the Rama students because they were called into the ministry, were trained for the ministry. That's where I taught and I saw the, the purpose of why they did that. ORU was designed to train young people and put them into different levels of society where you have born again, spirit filled doctors, born again, spirit filled attorneys, uh, born again, spirit filled accountants. I mean, all the different gamut of things that we have, but to put Christians in all levels of society and train well Christians. Of course, both had their visions, but my heart went out to those who were called specifically into pastoring, evangelism, missionary work. That's where my heart was. So these students would sit there and, and I went up to one young man because I understand he could take pictures. He was a good photographer. I asked him if he would do this. 
he said, no, I'm not going to do that. And I said, why? I need it. He says, no, no, I have a call on my life. I know any moment they're going to call me to go to the mission field. He said, I don't want to be involved in the church with this going on because I would just disappoint you and let you down. I thought, well, okay. And, you know, um, two months later, I came back and says, no, no, but I just know. In fact, I just really sense in me in just a few days, I'm going to get a call from someone. I said, okay. And finally, the third time I came to him, I said, he goes, no, 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 no. I know it's just any minute. I just know. And I cannot let you down. I can't get involved. I said, listen to me very carefully. I said, first of all, if you did accept what I have for you to do, and a week from now, you got a call, God would already have somebody in one week to replace you. Next, next of all, I'm asking you to do this because if you don't, uh, as, if you don't accept it now, that door won't open later. This is your proving ground. And what makes you think by just sitting here, a door's going to open up. I want you to get involved. And because you get involved, the door's going to open up. He said, I never thought about that. So he became the photographer of the church. You know how long he took for pictures in the church? Three years. Some of the best pictures, I mean, we just find stacks of them. He was an outstanding photographer. And at the end of three years, he finally got that phone call. You know what it was? It wasn't his degree from Rama. It wasn't the fact he just attended our church. It's the fact that he became faithful. Paul said, God found me faithful putting me into the ministry. When God found him to separate him, you know what he'd been doing? Being faithful. Whatever door would open up, he would just do it. No no thanks for it, not looking for thanks for it, not looking for a pat on the back. Paul just did it because he loved to do it. And he never lost that faithfulness. Once that starts in you, it keeps on going. Even later toward the end of the book of Acts, when Paul was shipwrecked on the island of Miletus and he, everybody was cold, freezing cold from the water. They just got up on the shore and were laying there cold. He got up and went over and got firewood, got bit by a snake, but he got firewood. He never lost that faithfulness part to serve other people. It is the heart of ministry. And what you do in the beginning proves your heart for the ministry. And that's what God's looking for. So when God found him, he found him faithful. What was Timothy to look for? Timothy looked for faithful men in the church who shall be able to teach others also. Notice when you find them, they are faithful. Notice this, they're not able yet to teach, but said they shall be. So present tense, find faithful people who future tense shall be able to teach others also. Right now, when you find them, they're just faithful. They couldn't teach their way of a paper bag. They probably don't even know much about, about you know, meeting people at the door, greeting people, ushering people in, being a helps minister. They don't know much about it, but you know what? They're teachable. When you find a person who is faithful to do anything you ask them to do, they are teachable. And that teachableness goes through them all the way to the end of their life. And they can constantly be taught and be taught and be taught. And they're faithful under somebody else's ministry. So God will give them their own. So this time of separation in Paul's life, notice what the Holy Spirit said. Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whence I have called them. Notice this, separate is present tense and have called is past tense. Paul was called on the road to Damascus in chapter 9 and here. Four chapters later in chapter 13, the point of separation finally comes and God separates Barnabas also. So the two go out on a missionary trip and this is where Paul's ministry really began in fullness. Up until this time, it's been preparation, 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 faithfulness, 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 faithfulness. There was a girl in our church one time and I was looking for somebody to run the bookstore and I kept looking for qualified people, qualified people. And you know what? Every time I'd ask them, they go, no, nah, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. And one day as I was praying in the church, this girl was a volunteer in the church working with the sound department. I caught her out of the corner of my eye and I'd thought about her before, but you know what? She had no qualifications at all. Why would I want to put somebody into the, into the bookstore that had no qualifications? And when I looked at her, the Lord gave me a scripture and said, above all, it's required of a steward that he be found faithful. And the Lord showed me she's been faithful. He said, you've been looking for qualifications. I look for faithfulness. And the Lord simply said this to me. He said, you can teach him qualifications, but you can't teach him faithfulness. Faithfulness is the foundation for everything in the word of God. And qualifications come on top of that. How many people look for qualified people first when understand something? A faithful person will stick with you for years. They just love you, love the church, love the ministry. And they may make some mistakes along the way, but you know what? They're teachable and that's what God's looking for. Not one person I find in the word of God was qualified when God called him in the ministry. By the time they were separated, they were. And so, but again, they started out with that faithfulness, faithfulness, faithfulness. In fact, if God found them and they were highly qualified in the beginning, he'd have to sweat out all of them and get them back to a point of utter total dependability on God then he could rebuild him into the mystery he had. So the time of separation for Paul came many years after his calling 
Almost 14 years had elapsed between those two events. Separate me again is present tense and have called is past tense because there's a time period between your calling and your separation. I think one of the greatest examples of this is in the Old Testament, and that is the story of Elijah and Elisha. And Elijah, because of his mood swings, because of his anger, because of his his constant trying to get with God and say, God, I'm better than everybody else. Lord, they've all they've all bowed to Baal. I and I only are the only one left. And finally, God just said, it's over, Elijah. I want you to know that there are many out there that have not bowed their knee unto Baal. And so uh, he said, I'm going to point one of them out to you. And so he said, you'll find him plowing when you get there. I imagine Elijah's, you know, Elijah's demeanor just fell when he found him plowing. You're going to replace me with a farmer? And the Lord simply was reminding him, I always take nobodies and make somebodies out of them. And he found Elisha and he threw the mantle around him. Now, when he threw that mantle around him, he was called. Elisha understood that and actually left, burned one of those and sacrificed one of those oxen that he was with, 12 yoke of oxen. He then went and followed after the ministry of Elijah. And all the books I have read said the same thing. He was with Elijah some 10 years. How would you like to be with a guy that was moody like Elijah, up and down, wide swing, emotional ups and downs? And he must, there been, must have been days we looked at him and said, how in the world could this guy be called to be a prophet? Look at the way he's acting. He's like a child right now. And you see that, not the world got to see that, just Elisha got to see that. And so finally there came a point after 10 years of standing faithful with Elijah, that this time Elijah went up into heaven and his mantle fell off and fell on Elisha. The first time the mantle fell on him, it was taken away. The second time it came on Elisha, he got to keep it. The first time the mantle fell on him, he was called. But after years of faithfulness to Elijah, the mantle fell on him. He got to keep it and he was separated. And all at that point is where the miracle started. He took that mantle and he hit the Jordan River just as Elijah had done to come over the Jordan River. He did it to go back across the Jordan River. He picked up right where Elijah left off. His ministry finished what Elijah was supposed to do. He had twice the anointing, did twice the number of miracles. But from that point on, his public ministry began and he started with signs, wonders, and miracles just like Elijah had. But what happened was he had to prove all that time of faithfulness. It still comes back to you. It hasn't changed at all. What God is looking for is faithfulness. And Proverbs tells us it's difficult to find a faithful man. It says qualified people are everywhere. A man that can brag on himself, you can find him everywhere. But a faithful Faithful man who can find. Faithfulness is the key to the point of separation. So if you've got a call on your life, stick with it. Take any door that opens up. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. And then one day that door is going to open wide open and God's going to say, now I can trust you with that full call that's on your life. See you next time. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity and faithfulness, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to contact Bob Yandian Ministries, visit bobyandian.com and click on Contact or call us at 918-250-2207. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts by visiting our website at bobyandian.com. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Thank you for watching today's broadcast. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.